Hello, everybody. Welcome to the CRMG podcast. My name is Nick Frost, and I'm one of the co-owners of CRMG. And today, very keen to introduce you to Simon Lacey. Simon, do you want to give us a snapshot who you are and what you do? Hi, Nick. It's great to be talking virtually. I've been working with the guys at CRMG for just over a year now as a principal consultant. My previous background in information security and information governance has been a number of years within the NHS, some time in private health, and latterly as policy manager at the Bank of England. Fantastic. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today, isn't it? So we're going to be talking about the policies. Actually, I have one question. You're obviously working at home, right? I have indeed. Are you still in your (laughs) pyjamas? I don't wear pyjamas, Nick. Oh, no. Right, let's move swiftly on (laughs) to the topic in hand. (laughs) Policies, cybersecurity policies. I've always felt personally, this may not sound like the most interesting topic, but it's one of those activities and organizations that I'm seeing more and more as being central to pretty much everything cybersecurity functions do. I think there are a number of reasons for that. Policy in organizations is king. It is something that you see in terms of, you know, your expense policy, your, I don't know, your finance policy, your hiring policy. It's that kind of approach, roadmap, document, whatever you want to call it, that really defines what is in scope with that approach and what is out of scope. And the same is true for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity policies or policy and their supporting standards are paramount to establishing that sort of baseline approach to how security is done. And what I notice around policies and a lot of the policy work that we've done is the interest and I suppose also importance of gaining that stakeholder input, getting that management buy-in, whether they, you know, they don't necessarily have to be experts in cybersecurity, but having their contribution, getting familiar with policies is something that helps with the next phase around how you implement all of this and what the commitment is from the business to help IT and security implement these changes. Would you agree with that in principle? Yeah, I think so, Nick. I think one of the biggest problems we have with policy is it gets an unfairly bad rap, in my opinion. Part of that is because traditionally policies have been written in silos. A guy sat in a basement, spools out 50 pages of PDF, which is then stuck somewhere on an internet that nobody can find. It bears relatively mm. little relationship to the business itself. People don't really understand it. It's written in ways that are not particularly clear and is very often portrayed as a stick to beat staff with when it goes wrong, rather than a more enlightened approach, which is a map and a guide to help staff and help organisations do the right thing. Yeah. And I think that's a really big speed change in, in attitude there, which is on that journey, but we're not there yet. But absolutely, without your stakeholders, without your SMEs, you're not going to influence the business. So if you're just going to take that approach of downloading a policy off the internet somewhere, and stuffing it on your intranet. It's a false sense of security and you're wasting your time. Don't bother doing it. Have no policy. That's much easier. Yeah, that's a good point because I suppose also in a, you know, in industries that are heavily regulated, I guess what you don't want is you don't want to have a policy that you're a million miles away from achieving. Policy should have a healthy dose of aspiration in there. Yeah. I think very often organisations will, something you'll encounter if you try and talk to SMEs and stakeholders about policy, oh, they'll, they'll very often come back to, well, we can't do that right now but this is still the right thing to do so you can then understand what the risk is it might be your legacy systems it might be actual employment processes that mean you can't quite hit that standard right yet but it's still the right thing to do so that your aspirations so you should write a policy which is not the right thing to do because that's really helpful you just serve the status quo yeah fine all right well look let's jump into it one of the things i was thinking about this podcast is Can we take a look at the life cycle of a policy and maybe use that to sort of flesh out some good hints and tips and practices for those that are going to listen? That's what I feel might be a good structure to follow here. Well, let's start off with assuming that a policy exists. It's four or five years old. Clearly, cybersecurity policy and cybersecurity in itself is very dynamic. So frequent updates are encouraged. What do you do? You know, you dust this policy off. Where do you start and what do you do next? That's a good point. It's probably something that a lot of organisations are facing right now, that policies are starting to come to the point of needing to be reviewed. I always have a bit of an interesting take on how often you need to review policies. 
yeah. is that if you write polities at a good enough level, they don't need too much reviewing. So you don't need to review. So you need to keep up there for four or five years, or whatever. That's probably aspirationally, if you have to review your policies four or five years, that's pretty good. So if you want to review a document now, I, mean, I think the first thing to do is not throw the baby out of the bathwater because what you've got might be completely appropriate for your business. So I think, I think rather than just automatically assuming what you've got is bad and needs lots of work, yeah. just sit there and actually have a look at it from a sensible perspective and say, okay, what do we want here? What are we trying to achieve? Mm. So before you review, I would always, as you start to review, any legislation that may have changed during the life cycle of that policy, so yeah. GDPR would be the absolute obvious one what we do, but there may be other things there too. Identify your stakeholders and your SMEs. So your subject matter experts are, as a policy writer, you should listen to those guys because they've got the wealth of experience there, they've got the knowledge. So taking GDPR is a great example. Getting your legal team involved. Yep. Now, your job as a policy writer is to make it impactful for the business, which means you take the advice <coughs> from legal and to convert it into a language that's understandable for your audience. Legal could be quite long and convoluted and complex, but yeah. necessity. How I would take it as a perhaps more, slightly more granular approach, once you've identified those stakeholders, those perhaps best practice changes, those legal changes, is then to, to, to circulate that out and ask for comment from real stakeholders. So just give them the opportunity to say, right, where do you think we are with this? Sometimes you'll have organisations that will say, well, yeah, okay, I'm the SME, I'll chip in with a few comments. One of the fundamental things for me, and I've found really, really powerful the stuff that I've done in my career is slightly more challenging as we're doing right now in the current situation. But actually sitting down with people in a room with a cup of coffee and have a conversation about it. If mm-hmm. you try and do it all over email, you end up got 30 emails and you've got weeks to lose sense of time. So yeah. in terms of practicality, sitting down with somebody, workshopping up, if that's appropriate, but sitting down with someone saying, well, like, what do you want from this policy as a stakeholder? What do you want from this as an SME? Yeah. And ask them that question. Because you're drawing them in, you're drawing them into the process and you're trying to do the right things. They can't really argue with you and they can't also come later on and say, hey, well, this is wrong or you know, this isn't right. Because yeah. most people will have a view on a policy. I've seen that myself. I think that's a good point. What you're saying there is achieving a consensus as a group. Because I can imagine trying to manage and balance 30 opinions in your inbox is it's just it would destroy your confidence with actually writing the policy. Okay, so what we're saying there is much more sort of collaborative, interactive approach for basically crafting what we think are, or agreeing first, what the gaps are. Is that existing policy sufficient for the business today? And of course, for the future, because I think it's probably worth putting a timestamp on the policy when you're looking to review it next, so you can future-proof it if you like. But getting a range of different players involved in helping to shape and craft the actual policy. Just on that note, so who are the key contributors to that steering committee? Who would you have involved in that workshop? I guess I mentioned some of them previously. So legal, for example, would be one. Actually, depending on what the policy is and what you're looking to achieve, I tend to favour smaller, bite-sized policies rather than a great big Bible of text. Right. Then the relevant SME, so if it was more about security and recruitment, for example, you'd get HR involved. And I've used this previously to some good effect, trade unions. Okay. Involving the union is you're working with them rather than saying, here's a policy and you have to make sure that your members are engaging. That can give you a slightly different slant because they can help you pick up on some of the language that you might be using. Yes. I would also have representation there, if you're able to, from your audience. So if you've got a policy, say it's a policy about behaviours or conduct, yeah. which is organisation-wide, so you've got an organisation of 10,000 people. Everybody needs to comply with that policy. Is actually trying to get a cross-section of your audience. Yes. Uh, that can be quite challenging. I have quite often done it to find out who's the biggest critic of the policy first. Yeah. And spend some time on that on a one-to-one basis. There's one person there who is always going to be anti. If you can win them over, everybody else is a piece of cake. Yeah. And when we look at the audience, I would also look at, bearing in mind it might be the CEO that has to agree to the policy. It might be the person who does five hours a week in a fairly low paid role and everybody in between. So you have to craft it in the way that they're going to have an impact to them and they can understand it. And I would pick out people like if you've got neurodiverse members of staff who are open about dyslexia or autism or whatever, that's probably 15, approximately 15% of your workforce will be there. If you can ask them to contribute too, that can be really powerful in getting the wording right. Particularly if it's a whole organisation type document. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. The whole language and how you craft that, because 
let's be honest, you have a number of key individuals you have legal who obviously have a particular style of writing. You may have input from certain areas of the business, including IT and security, who, you know, we may or may not be great at crafting the right words and trying to succinctly state a control objective that actually can be understood by people who don't have English as a first language. So, you know, this is becoming more of an art than a science. But maybe you could just touch on a little bit of, in your experience, when you're writing policies, obviously, at the Bank of England, what hints and tips you got in terms of being able to make and translate a cybersecurity policy requirement to people that may not be experts in cybersecurity? It's got to be clear and concise. I'd always go for technology agnostic because mm-hmm. a policy shouldn't be about the technology. So using things like must as a statement. Yeah. You must. You are responsible for. I think if you start introducing a mix and match of terms and phrases, you can end up with a situation where people could argue that, well, hang on a minute, that to me sounds like it was optional. So that's Yeah, what I, mean. I so see. Interchange with, oh, it's guidance. Well, guidance isn't the same as an instruction. And I think it needs to be that that clarity around that that's the value that comes from your stakeholders and getting input from your audience as well as you know and the SMEs is it helps that language to get to just the right place now writing a policy is easy by and large writing a policy that impacts the business in the right way is the art is the alchemy if you like yeah from taking a dry document that just has lots of ISO 27002 controls in it into something that is actionable uh, uh, job level because again I think it's something that people who write policies can often forget people who are following the policy it's part of their job yeah. it's not their job yeah. if that makes sense they're busy they're under a lot of pressure they've got lots of stuff going on if you sit there and make it so onerous the policy that they can't function they will simply circumvent it anyway yeah. so you then got a policy that has got no credibility which in a knock on effect is probably the whole framework that falls apart of the wealth I can't do that because the technology doesn't allow me to do that. You, you told me I've got to have a complex password, but the system only allows me to have six characters. Your policy says it's got to be 12. Well, I can't do anything about that. So it's making sure they're relevant to people. And that's part of the communication process anyway when you launch policies, making sure people understand why they should do it. If you just give people random instructions, it's a limited impact. If people understand why it's for the betterment of the organisation and satisfying business objectives, that's a much more powerful argument. All right, so following through this sort of life cycle approach, so we've talked about those people you typically want to get involved, how that would look like, how you'd approach writing policies in a pragmatic way that people will understand. Going back to your point, you when you're launching those policies, what typically happens next? And do you grant the organization a grace period because, you know, you're introducing change, for example? What would be that sort of last phase following the launch of a new policy? And actually, if I can just add a second question into this, because this is the multi-million pound question I get asked is, are we talking about one policy and supporting standards or multiple policies or what? There doesn't seem to be a universal agreement there, but there's two really easy questions I (laughs) thought I'd introduce for you. (laughs) Off you go. Okay, taking your second question first, I've alluded to what my preference is, but actually, if I'm working for an organisation, my preference is pretty much irrelevant, really. It's what suits the organisation. So I've seen organisations that like to have a big chunky manual, effectively all their policies. I find that quite intimidating to read and quite difficult. You've got the barrier there that is somewhere in those 50, 60, 70, 80 pages. I prefer a set of smaller documents which have clearly defined audience. And if you name them appropriately, that also means you can flex your language too. So okay. a conduct or behaviours policy, that applies to everybody in the organisation. The technology policy might have a technology slant to it. So yeah. that means you can use some language that's more appropriate for the guys in the IT department. You have to follow that policy. If it's HR, for example, or people policy, so it's around recruitment, etc. So you can slant the language to the jargon that goes with those disciplines. Okay. I prefer that route. In terms of grace periods, again, I've seen organisations fall into this pit hole. They've pushed out policies with the expectation that the day they've gone out, everyone has to comply <laughs> and there's a sanction behind it. If they don't comply with it, that's setting people up to fail. You've got to be reasonable. Three months is, again, it's been a if you've reviewed it, you've made changes. They're minor changes, i.e. a tweak of language or whatever, okay, you don't need that. If it's a new policy that's radically different, then, yeah, you're going to have to convince the organisation a fair and proper warning about what the changes are and allow them to ramp up there. 
And it might be three months. If it's a technology-facing policy, it might be something that you go through a, a digital transformation programme and you're spending lots of money on new kit. It might be the current kit you use just simply can't meet that requirement. So then it would be replaced in six, eight, 10, 12 months or whatever. Yeah. So it's important to give that grace period because otherwise that's another reason why people won't engage. Oh, well, I can't do that. Switch off. And that's where things like exemptions, etc., time-bound exemptions could be quite powerful in helping people engage. Okay, great. All right, Simon, that's been really useful. Thank you very much for your sharing your experience and those practical hints and tips. Thank you all for listening in. If you have more information, you can reach out to CRMG on our website, crmg-consult.com, or reach out directly to myself, nick.frost, at crmg-consult.com. Thanks for listening and watch out for our other podcasts.